Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining me for today's SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup. This is our first edition of the new year. Uh, happy to be with you again after a two-week break for Christmas and New Year's holidays. And today we're going to be taking a look at three issues that have popped up over the last couple of weeks in international ed news feeds. And we'll take a look at how those might be impacting what you do on your college and university campuses. Before we begin, let me introduce myself. My name is Marty Bennett. I'm the president and founder of Social Media and International Education Consulting. And we offer this um, weekly news, uh, news roundup, midweek roundup, uh, to give you a chance uh, to hear our perspectives on uh, some of the issues affecting our industry and how you might be able to uh, use this information to your benefit on your individual college campuses. Uh, and what we do each Monday uh, is we produce a newsletter called All the SMIE News Fit to Share. comes in your inboxes free of charge on Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern. And we take three of those stories from that roundup of news uh, that covers international ed and social media news. And we then take three of those stories on Wednesday and highlight those, go a bit more in depth to help you find uh, information that might be relevant for you and maybe look at things from a perspective that you might not have considered previously. Uh, so what we're going to do today is we'll take a look at some uh, very important issues. Uh, we all know I I'm after the Open Doors release in November, there's been a lot of uh, analysis of those uh, uh, of those uh, of those recent numbers that have popped in and what that might mean for uh, universities and colleges around the United States and what we what we do uh, what we do each week and particularly this week we're going to look at one of the major organizations uh, that are involved with international education in the United States and that is NACAC National Association for College Admissions Counseling uh, they have an, have had an international division for about 10 years now uh, that has uh, provided some extra support resources for its members, which are undergraduate admissions offices in the United States, as well as overseas uh, college counselors uh, that are working with students looking to come to the United States. So uh, uh, the International ACAC is an affiliate of NACAC, uh, but the NACAC National Office has, as I mentioned, an international initiatives division that uh, does quite a bit of work in the field and has some uh, has just produced a very useful uh, report uh, or article online on their site related to international student mobility to the United States. Uh, it takes a look at some of the reasons, and this is what we'll highlight today, some of the reasons for the decline. We've covered those uh, quite a bit here on the Roundup, but we'll look at how um, a major national organization is uh, looking at these issues. Uh, we'll also uh, take a look at ISTAR's uh, review site, a TripAdvisor site for international educators. And then we'll look at uh, China, again, a uh, common theme throughout the roundup over the last few, few weeks and months, uh, but looking at them in a, in a global perspective on how not just uh, they are sending hundreds of thousands of students abroad every year, but they're also becoming increasingly a, a primary destination for international students. So we'll talk about what that means. Uh, so let's start with NACAC, and this uh, report, as I mentioned, uh, has just come out over the holidays, and Rena, th thank you for joining. I hope all is well with you. Uh, looking forward to your contributions on this, uh, to the discussion here. Uh, with regard to uh, this report from NACAC, uh, they highlight uh, a lot of the reasons for decline in the new in international students enrolled, uh, enrolling this past uh, year as well as the past three years. Uh, they look at competition with other countries, uh, which we talk about regularly here on the Roundup. They talk about student concerns about guns and violence, increased visa delays or denials, uh, uncertainty regarding the future of H-1B visas, uh, unpredictable U.S. political environment, reduction of scholarship programs in home countries like Saudi Arabia, high tuition costs at U.S. institutions, and challenges completing standardized testing outside of the United States. I think that's really a very accurate summary of the range of issues that are impacting international students uh, in terms of their choices, in terms of where they, where they can and will decide to go, and some, some of the reasons specifically why the United States has been impacted negatively over the last, uh, last 
three years at least. And from those eight major issues that they've outlined, there are certainly few, a uh, few of these uh, that can be laid at, squarely at the footsteps of the current administration. But there are also quite a few on that uh, reduction of outside scholarship programs, uh, high tuition rates, uh, standardized testing access, uh, competition with other countries that certainly are beyond this, insti this, or this administration's scope. Uh, so I think it does portray uh, fairly the, range, the wide range of issues that are impacting international students. Delcy, thanks for joining me. Hope you're well and uh, life, is, uh, life is good. And I don't know if you're fully retired now. I know you've been doing quite a bit with other institutions consulting, but I hope you're well. Uh, looking forward to your contributions to the discussion here as well. But the NACAC report, I think, is very useful uh, because, as, as with most things uh, in this world, uh, it's not just enough to lay blame at the feet of uh, politics or overseas competition or other factors. It's, you got, you got to have some, uh, some idea what to, how to respond to these things, uh, these crises. Veronica, good to see you too. Uh, hope you're well. And with the NACAC report, what they do also uh, outline are some steps that people can take uh, to, uh, to respond uh, to the concerns that these uh, decline in international student numbers means. Uh, they talk about outreach and advocacy as two of the big elements of uh, strategies that institutional reps can use. So uh, kudos to, uh, to the team at NACAC's International Initiatives Division and uh, I know that uh, Lindsay Addington and her team there are doing great work, uh, and I'm really happy that they're, uh, they're, they're getting on the bandwagon here and taking proactive steps, not only outlining the issues, but also equipping their members uh, to, to respond uh, to this. And that what that means is, and some of the steps they outline, talking to your dean or president and sharing your, institu your institution's international student enrollment figures, the history as well highlighting the economic consequences of declines in enrollment and discuss reasons for that. Uh, and not just your own institution being an island in the sea where everybody else is, is, is seeing increases and you're the only one seeing decreases. Certainly not the case. And certainly our leaders need, our institutional leaders need to be made aware of that. Uh, but it's also about uh, going beyond your own institution and encouraging uh, elected officials to support policies as NACAC outlines here that promote international student mobility to the United States. So there's, uh, there's several ways to do this. Uh, they mention uh, NACAC's annual advocacy day that they hold in uh, late February, early March. NAFSA has their own version of that in February or March. So uh, they have various action alerts that NAFSA puts out that are, are very useful, I think. And they equip you, uh, if you to get in touch with your congressmen, uh, your senators, to let them know of your concerns as a constituent of your state, of your districts, uh, to how valuable these students are to our nation and support to support policies that are encouraging uh, of, of, of international student enrollments in our, in our institutions. Sister cities, business leaders need to be engaged. Uh, where there are partner relationships, sister states, uh, those types of things. Your state consortia can be an excellent resource. So that's not part of this list from NACAC, but certainly a lot of ways that your individual, uh, that you can go beyond your own institution uh, in terms of impacting uh, what uh, your, your district, your, uh, your state, uh, your region, uh, or other institutions, like-minded institutions. And certainly that was one thing uh, when we look back in histories of uh, recent history on the on when there was a uh, a previous dip post 9/11, one of the things that we we experienced in Indiana, where I was uh, working at the time, is uh, we needed to band together as 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 institutions because we knew we were up against it then with the perception in the Muslim world about the United States not being a welcoming destination anymore. Uh, we we formed together as a state consortia. We did. Uh, consortium and we developed a number of activities to help attract uh, more international students to our state. Uh, there's there's real real value in that when we work together as uh, organizations, uh, as uh, institutions together as a state organization or regional or national organizations to really showcase our, our what we have as as institutions as a as a state but also individual institutions. And really, the value of that is, is cannot be overstated in this mar in this kind of a climate, where we are being faced by a lot of other 
uh, a lot of other issues that are, are impacting our ability to, to reach our reach prospective students. So again, kudos to NACAC for a great report. Uh, and as, as we do all, always, we post uh, the links to these stories in the comments section here on the Facebook page for SMIE Consulting. Uh, we also uh, podcast this, uh, this on uh, your favorite podcast providers. So if you'd rather listen than watch, uh, you can certainly download at your pleasure and subscribe to the uh, Midweek Roundup podcast available on iTunes, Google Play, Podbean, Stitcher, or uh, Spotify. Uh, so please do take advantage of that if you aren't. And thanks to those who have already subscribed. We've had over 400 downloads of the podcast in the last, uh, few, last year. I'm very happy to, uh, to bring this to you each week, and hopefully we'll have, uh, have more of you listening as, as the days and weeks go, go along. Now, next up is ISTARS. Uh, this is uh, a new, pro new uh, service that was launched, free service that was launched last fall uh, by Jessica Guyver at uh, University of Texas San Antonio. Uh, Jessica has been in international ed for a number of years, uh, first in the UK, uh, but has come over to the US in the last few years and is working down at UT San Antonio uh, as director of under international undergraduate admissions. Uh, real, uh, real leader in the field, uh, and certainly we're, uh, she's put together this service here, featured in a, in a recent Pi News article. Uh, it's called Inter I S T A R S, and so when I first see that, I think of Ishtar, uh, that awful uh, Dustin Hoffman movie and Warren Beatty movie from the '80s. Uh, that's uh, was just horrendous, and <laughs> but it's, it's certainly not that. Uh, the Ishtar is stands for International Student Admissions and Recruitment Services Review. This star's review. So what uh, Jessica's idea for this service is uh, for it to serve as sort of a, a trip advisor for international education. So for professionals in the field that are looking to find out more about uh, different service providers for CRMs, for uh, lead generation, for uh, re-engagement with, with prospective students, a lot of different services out there, a lot of different systems out there, hard to make sense of them all. So it's a place where hopefully people can go on and if you've used systems uh, or products or services, been to conferences, uh, used uh, services from Education USA to AIRC to all these other organizations out there in, that, are, uh, that are important pieces of the puzzle for international educators to know. Uh, it's a place for reviews, kind of a trip advisor for international education admin, administrators and officials. So I definitely recommend you check it out. The Pi News does a nice, uh, has a nice article about it. I'm also going to be posting the link to the actual review site. And it does, uh, right now it's obviously, it started in October and a lot of the initial uh, content on it was uh, generated by Jessica and her team. Uh, that, uh, that have been engaged with uh, the different service providers from the conferences to the organizations to CRM providers to tri uh, recruitment, pr recruitment tour providers. All of those kinds of things are covered with this ISTARS review system. Uh, so if you if uh, appeal for me, if you have used any of these products or services or organizations or trips or services, do uh, get on there and uh, add your content. And, and this is... Uh, uh, add your opinions, your reviews of the services you've used to the site and make it a, a useful one for our colleagues in the field because that, that's what we're all here for in international ed is to really support each other. I think uh, even though we have jobs at our institutions, we definitely feel a certain allegiance to each other and, uh, and need to support each other, particularly in times like these when uh, we're all uh, under the gun, so to speak, with regard to uh, bringing in classes and having uh, to diversify our, our recruitment sources and all these other uh, all the other factors that we're, we're facing day to day. So I definitely encourage you all uh, to check out the ISTARS site and uh, let it be a, a place where you can go to for information and uh, other, other reviews like TripAdvisor. Uh, there's not an app for that yet, but uh, I'm sure if it develops well enough, uh, that, that could be in the offing. Uh, but certainly uh, it, it's a concept that certainly fits with the times uh, where we all are all want to want to before we buy a product, before we uh, use a service, before we go to a conference. We want to know if it's actually going to be worthwhile for us. Uh, talking to peers is certainly going to help us find that out. But if there's a central clearinghouse for this kind of information uh, that uh, we can all contribute to regularly, uh, certainly recommend that uh, this this is a great idea that uh, hopefully more of uh, more folks in our profession will engage in. So kudos to Jessica uh, and, and her team at UTSA and hopefully that uh, will become a more regular 
feature in, uh, in international education offices. All right, uh, we'll turn now to uh, a topic, uh, China is a huge topic, obviously, a huge country, over a billion people uh, that are, uh, are always on our thoughts and minds, certainly in international ed circles, we're typically either uh, thinking about ways uh, that we can uh, stem the flow of, of decline in Chinese students coming to our campus, or if you haven't had any success in China, how do you break into that market? What are the ways you can do that? Uh, we've talked about a lot of those here on the Roundup over the past uh, few months. But uh, one thing that I think is has gone under the radar for a lot of institutions, and it's part of what my, my approach here at the Roundup is to use the, the, this time to really put what we do in the United States in a global context. And one, as the NACAC report about the reasons for declines to the, of international students coming to the United States for new ones in the last few years, uh, the reason, one of those reasons is increased global competition. And it's so hard for us sometimes even to get out of our own institutional bubbles to understand how significant a problem this is that uh, the United States for many years uh, was kind of the unassailed uh, a leader in international ed uh, and in for international student mobility for students coming to our country. Uh, there was really never a concern. Yeah, Australia was out there, the UK were out, was out there, but uh, as other major destination countries, but we had such a large unassailable lead. That lead is shrinking, or as, as we've talked about, uh, that our piece of the global international student mobility pie has shrunk uh, to, from about 25, 26% back in 2000 to uh, under, I think it's 20% uh, 20, 20 21% now. Uh, those numbers are gonna continue to decline uh, as a percentage of the overall pie. But the part of the part of the, the positive side of how we need to look at this is our is the global globally mobile group of students that are going are studying outside their country is increasing. Uh, that number was uh, 2.7 million uh, back in uh, back in the early 2000s. It's over f almost five million now. So that pie has almost doubled in the last 20 years. And what that means is um, uh, obviously they haven't all come to the United States. Is there there are more destination countries that these uh, students are considering. Uh, that 10, 15 years ago, China was not even in the top 20 as a destination market for international students. And as we've talked about on the Roundup here before, and one thing that I don't think a lot of colleagues uh, appreciate in the, in the industry now, is it's not just uh, the, <clears throat> it's not just US, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand uh, as the major English speaking destinations that are are, are where students are, are growing. New Zealand's actually far down the list. Uh, it's like 11th or 12th now. But uh, China is now third as a destination, maybe even second as uh, the number two destination for international students. Certainly within the next couple of years, they're looking to overtake the UK. Depending on which measures you use, they may already be past the UK. Uh, the Chinese market is one that is for international students is one that is very rife for uh, for interest. Uh, there has been growing a growing number of of, uh, of uh, countries that have been sending students to China. Uh, part of that we've talked about here on the Roundup before is due to the Belt and Road Initiative uh, that China has introduced, where over the last uh, 10, 15 years they've spent over a trillion dollars in. Uh, in infrastructure projects primarily, but also educational uh, educational partnerships, scholarship programs to bring students from countries where they have these large investments um, in infrastructure and other resources for countries uh, in South and East Asia, in Africa in particular, now they're expanding into Europe. So what does that mean for, uh, for, for China? That they are spending, they see as a priority Hey, we've seen what's happened to the United States, and we, when we talk about the United States as a destination for international students, uh, I used to work with Education USA and uh, with the folks at the State Department. One of their philosophies was, or, or guiding principles was, we're creating um, foreign foreign students today, world leaders tomorrow. Uh, that the students that come to the United States are educated here are typically the ones that, when they return home, are going to become leaders in their countries. Uh, whether it's the scholarship programs that brought them to this country in the first place or they were coming from families that were already well-connected for a, a U.S. education, 
and going back. They come here, experience our culture, experience what the United States is really about, and they take those values home with them to help influence when they become leaders in business, in politics, in whatever it might be, they become leaders who, who know the United States and know what we're about. Uh, and that's what gets lost, I think, in the, in the shuffle, uh, that it's a, the State Department sees it very much as a public diplomacy tool. Uh, the international students that come to the U.S. and go home and U.S. students that go abroad and then return home. Uh, other departments in the United States, governments, the uh, Commerce Department sees uh, very much it as a business enterprise with international education. Uh, the students that come, international students that come from our board are seen, are seen as an export industry worth over $42 billion a year. So when we look at these various issues uh, and see, and China obviously having seen this, uh, what's happened with the U.S., with the U.K., Australia over the years, they've seen uh, what that's meant for their, our countries. It's now seeing, uh, well, they, they want some of that too. They want to expand their influence in the world and have those students come to uh, come to the to come to um, come to China uh, to be educated and to understand the country more and to experience its culture and all of the wonderful things that we 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 shout from the rooftops about how valuable uh, that experience is for international students coming to our country. China's trying to do the same thing for theirs, and understanding that what China is doing, uh, particularly in Africa, when you look at the the amount of money they've spent in Africa, or either Chinese com companies, Chinese government officials, projects by, na by national products, uh, pr pro projects and products that have been developed, uh, that uh, they have um, built huge uh, infrastructure projects, uh, airports, seaports, uh, bases, um, uh, roadways, uh, all of these things are put in part of that Belt and Road Initiative, but they've also laid down a s strong foundation in Africa uh, to bring students from those countries back to China for, for, for studies. Uh, this, the scholarship programs that they put in place, the relationships that they've developed, now have placed China second as a destination country after France then China, and then the U.S. and the U.K. as des the top destinations for African students studying outside their home countries. And that's significant. Uh, China wasn't even on the radar 20 years ago for African students as a destination. But uh, in, in the in the noughties and the teens, uh, China had expanded their higher ed capacity. They developed international divisions of their universities to, to, to host uh, international students. They've incorporated hundreds and if not thousands of English language programs at their institutions to attract students from around the world. To, to give you a sense of how significant this is, uh, one of the companies, uh, organizations I do work for is the British Council, uh, IELTS in particular. Uh, the British Council is part of IELTS that they own uh, as a, using that as a tool to uh, give international students access uh, English language-wise to different educational markets. <clears throat> and um, in the last year, uh, I've been asked by IELTS as part of, part of uh, my responsibilities for them is to provide summaries on a quarterly basis in both a report form but also doing uh, live, uh, live chats like this uh, for student markets, uh, students, international students that are looking to go to the traditional markets, U.S., UK, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, but they've also, since May this year, have asked me to start doing one for China. And that's been really valuable for me to un understand, because part of the, what, I, what I present each, each quarter is, okay, here's what the process is if you're looking to apply to universities in China, to U.S., wherever. Here's uh, the steps to t you go through to apply for a visa. Here's how much it costs. You go through a lot of the details there providing that in report form, but also in live chat form, and talking about options. And the, when I first started that, I was like, China? Why are we doing, why is China one of, one of these, one, a, a serious destination? But it is. The reality is that uh, China is uh, the top, top three, top two, top three in the world right now as a destination for international students. So it's, one, it's certainly one thing that international educators need to be aware of. Uh, and certainly as we position our own institutions uh, as it relates to our competition in the world for uh, international students, uh, we, we need to understand who our, comp who our competitors are. 
Uh, and, and again, it's now, it's not just the English speaking world. It's, it's understanding how uh, we fit as a, as a country, the United States fits as a country in relation to other, other major markets where students are also considering. So no longer is it just an international student from, uh, from India or China is just looking at the United States. They're looking at uh, first destinations in their home countries, uh, but also in their region, but also other English speaking destinations, and maybe even Europe uh, for an Indian or Chinese student. They might be looking at Germany. They might be looking at France as well as the UK as a, as a potential option. And those have become realistic and practical options as other countries have developed capacity and develop uh, international education and international student recruitment offices on their, in their campuses. Uh, it's really been a sea change over the last 30 years in, uh, that I've been in the industry uh, into understanding what's going on and how individual countries are positioning themselves as, as destinations for, for international students. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of, bit of perspective on, uh, on who our competition really is. And it is a very broad, uh, broad swath of the world that is now involved in international st student recruitment. So until next time, we'll uh, cover more topics like this uh, in next week's roundup. Uh, again, 1 p.m. Eastern on Wednesdays. So I want to thank a uh, big shout out to those that have been downloading the podcast each week and listening in. Uh, it's good to be back in 2020. Looking forward to some uh, wonderful conversations and some amazing uh, new topics we'll be covering in the coming weeks and months. So have a great day. Cheers. <laughs>